I am Adit yeah. Sharma, senior editor at Home Crux magazine, and we've been covering design, architecture, production design, home decor for over a decade, and have interviewed many eminent personalities like the Pritzker Prize director, Salon Del Mobile president, Oscar-winning production designer with the likes of uh, Dan Hanna, Grant Major, uh, Paul D. Osterberry, and it is indeed my pleasure to have you with Home Crux today. I'd call you, oh. I prefer calling you Don instead of Donald, because I yes. believe you're yes, the absolutely. Don of the design world. Most people, <laughs> winning, most people dream of getting nominated for Oscars, and you not just got nominated for it, you won it not once, but twice. So, oh, yeah. well, yeah, I, I guess so. I mean, you know... <laughs> I appreciate your interest in me. And uh, where, where are you located? We're based in India. We're based in New Delhi, India. Oh, really? Oh, wonderful. Yeah, that's great. That's great. You, yeah. You, you're in LA at, at, where are you located? You're in LA at the moment? I'm in Los Angeles. Yes, I'm in Los you're Angeles. You're in your home? You're in your hotel? I'm in my home. <laughs> you're in your home. All right. So I'm in my I'm, home. <laughs> I want to ask you, how's your day going? Because I assume it has just begun. It is 7 a.m. in LA at the moment. Yo, it's going fine. Yeah, I'm an early riser, so I'm up and ready to go. What time is it there? It is 7.30 p.m. here in India. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So there's a wow. straight 12-hour 12, 12 difference. So what did you do? What did you do? You woke up, you had your breakfast and stuff? Yeah, I woke up. I uh, had some coffee. I just sat and relaxed. I watched the sun start to peak up, and, you know, then I got ready to uh, get the Zoom all organized and situated um i'm not a real tech head to be honest with you so uh it takes me a few minutes to get that all kind of put in line but uh yeah that's kind of it you know nice quiet morning a sunny day here wonderful so don mm -hmm. i'd start from the beginning and then i'd obviously uh, talk about movies production design and all that stuff but i'll start from the scratch where did it sure. all begin from for you? Tell us about yourself, your childhood, the years growing up. What did your parents used to do? Oh, um, I grew up in the Midwest of the United States, um, had, in a very small town, had a simple childhood, sort of the uh, typical American childhood. You know, I went to a public school. This was in the 60s. Um, Which town were you born? Uh, well, actually, I was born in New Jersey, and we moved to Kansas when I was a young boy. Um, I I grew up in this small town, and then when I graduated, I went to college in Arizona, <clears throat> studied art at Arizona State University in Tempe, Arizona, which is part of Phoenix. Um, I had a very simple childhood, very simple upbringing, you know, sort of... Uh, I won't say the idyllic American life, but, you know, it was small townish. It was simple life, you know, kind people, um, generous people, but not not a great deal of exposure to the world. So I was anxious to get out and understand the world and experience the world. And I became interested in art and I went and studied art in Arizona. <clears throat> and that was my um my stepping stone into this business and moving to Los Angeles. So what drew you to a career in production design? How did you land your first job as a production designer? Oh boy. Okay. So I kind of came in through the back door, to be honest with you. Um, I didn't grow up watching movies or um, again, it was a very small town. It had, it was kind of like last picture show one theater um, and we wouldn't always get the, the top line movies that were, that were being played. Um, I, uh, I studied art and it was in the seventies in college. And, um, I kind of say that was re reservation because it wasn't, it was a very sort of liberal art school and it wasn't traditional art. It was, you know, the seventies were so influenced by, the movements of conceptualism and and performance art and things like that and i sort of was attracted to the conceptual um way of expressing oneself through art and the school relied less on teaching fundamentals and it was more about how you think and um 
what is in your heart and your soul in terms of what you want to express and how you see the world and so forth. So, you know, I remember a professor there telling me once, um, you won't come away from this university and this education with a great body of work necessarily, but you will come away with a, a way of thinking. You will, you will be able to find that you, you harvest a sensitivity in your education here as to how you see the world and how you interpret it. And that's always kind of stuck with me. And um, between that and sort of the aesthetic of growing up in a small town and walking the alleys and, and seeing the textures <clears throat> and sort of romanticizing as a child, sort of, and, you know, um, staring at clouds, so to speak, <laughs> and dreaming and imagining um it kind of it kind of led me into art and art led me into becoming a janitor um that was my first job when i graduated college i went to see the career service and they said you know here's what you're qualified for so i became a night janitor <clears throat> for a couple of years and some friends of mine who are graduate students in phoenix um opened up a small scenery shop and they called me one day and asked me if I'd like to help them with a project they had. And so that's where it kind of started. And I didn't really think of actually getting into production design or even getting into the film business. I always at that point in life thought, you know, I want to figure out how to be an artist. I want to figure out how to do it. Um, I was kind of searching in life. And then as I continued to work for this company, and we did very small regional um, pieces of scenery for commercials and so forth and trade shows. Um, one thing led to another and I thought, okay, well, this is, this is an avenue I never thought of. And <clears throat> the company um, eventually opened a, a shop in Los Angeles and I moved over to work in it. And so that's when I started in 1980, I came to Los Angeles and I worked in a small scenery shop a very boutique scenery shop called EATS, E-A-T-S, which stood for Eclectic Arts and Technology Service. And I did everything from sweeping a floor to um, driving a truck and doing pickups of lumber to plastering walls to painting walls to every layer of building a set. And then eventually I started <laughs> on some of their commercials Um doing some of the propping and some of the decorating. And so it was a, in the early 80s when there's a lot of independent commercial work and large commercials in Los Angeles. It was a good stepping stone to sort of learn each layer of the art department. And my interest developed as well as my, um, my skill set and my understanding of what it took to put together a good set. And I always look back on that with... Um, with with cherished thoughts because I learned hands on pretty much every every level of trade that is involved in building a set and putting together a set. So, what was your first film? How did you land that job? Oh, my first film was the Joy Luck Club, and it was directed by Wayne Wang. And um, through all my commercial experience, there was a DP named Amir Mokri <clears throat> who very generously and i'm completely indebted to him in my life and to wayne um suggested to wayne my name from some projects i'd worked with him on um, commercially and wayne was an independent filmmaker from chinatown and he was doing this film called joy luck club which was i'm not sure if you're familiar with it it's based on the amy tan book uh it's, it's chinese story of mothers and daughters and he called me to do it. And it was a very low budget film. And I had never done a film. And quite honestly, when I look back on it, I didn't even know what I was doing. But, um, you know, I built the sets. I brought the same work ethic that I had in commercials. And <clears throat> it was definitely a, a learning process for me to, to understand the difference between a commercial and a film. But... Wayne was very patient with me and um, I'm very grateful to him to this day for the projects he's involved me in because he kind of hung with me during my, my growing time on films. And 
he um, <clears throat> he taught me more than anything. I think Wayne awakened me to what a director is and what his responsibilities are and how there was something more to directing than just doing a commercial. I'd worked with commercial directors and uh, albeit they were very nice and talented and good, but, you know, commercials are about putting the bottle of beer in front of the, the, the guy at the table and having it look nice and, you know, telling a short little story that leads to product. And Wayne was somebody that I was able to witness a director on a different level that was telling a story about a story about the heart and the soul of people. And um, that, that film always has a special place in my heart because of that. So, more, so from there, yeah. it led, it, it led from one film to another. And again, during my early years in, in doing films, um, I was learning and growing at the same time, you know, and I don't think there's, I don't think there's anybody that can't look back and say, Oh, I wish I had known this when I did this project, or I wish I had done this when I did this project. And I'm very honest about it, admitting it, that I think it's all part of learning and growing and understanding and honing your aesthetic, so to speak. So most people dream of winning a single Oscar, like I said, you went on to win two. What's the experience been like and what has the recognition meant for your career? Mm. You know, I'm kind of a quiet guy, to be honest with you. I'm I'm quiet and reserved and I shy away from attention, <laughs> to be truthful. Um, I feel very blessed and I'm very grateful that I've had the opportunity to be recognized as I have. Um. It's funny, I have Indian neighbors who are very close to me across the street. And oh. they, oh, yeah, they're from um, Mumbai. And they just, you know, they're so supportive and they've been so excited over are it. They, over are they the in year. the filmmaking business or they do something? Yeah, like actually, they are. Um, oh. Uh, yeah, Ravi Sambawi. And he he works in the camera business. He um, His brother is a producer in India. And his sister is a production designer in India, and she does mostly commercials. And he works in the trade, and he he um, he gets lenses and cameras and so forth, and does that supply work for them uh, on their projects. So yeah, they're definitely in the business. Yeah, so it's interesting, you know, it's a small world, right? Indeed, <laughs> they're our closest friends. Yeah, they're our closest friends. We like to have vegetarian food with them. In any case. Um, you know, I'm very grateful for the recognition. Um, I realize that there are so many talented people that do what I do. And it is, it is always sort of the, the luck of the draw. It has to do with the project, has to do with the director. Um, and I'm not demeaning what I contributed. I'm, I just feel that, you know, these things, you know, they have their course. There's so many, so many talented people that have done so many beautiful projects um, in terms of design and art direction and on so many levels it's it's really I feel blessed you know you said you like to have vegetarian food if you'd like to name any no oh, um well I'll tell you what I really one of my weak spots are samosas vegetables, oh samosas. I, yeah. I love samosas I love yeah, yeah, yeah. you'd find some of the best samosas here in India, in New Delhi, in fact, in Shimla, in fact, I am currently in Shimla, which is a, a small capital of a small state, Himachal Shimla. Pradesh. It is. How do you is, spell that? How do you spell that? S H I M L A, Shimla. Oh, okay. I'll ask to have Ravi about that. He'll be interested that I spoke with you. He'll oh, be very right. interested. Yeah. It's a very small world. You know, he always, whenever we go out, he always orders and I there's something that he orders. It's like a vegetarian, it's like a dumpling in a sauce. Um is it I momos? Say, is it called momos? Yes, karma. Yes, yes, yes. All yes, right. Yes, very you good. you love having it. Momos is not actually Indian. Samosa is pretty popular over here. Momos mm -hmm. have more or less originated from I'm not sure about it. Maybe Tibet or maybe China. I guess it's popular. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure I could yeah. be wrong, but yeah, samosa is pretty yeah. popular over here. I just had samosa yeah. a couple of days back. <laughs> it's it's the stuff well, my wife, that 
It's the stuff my wife likes... the yummiest part about it. Oh yeah, my wife likes dosa from the southern. Dosa, India. yes, dosa is dosa. also popular. It's more popular dosa in South good. India. So if you yeah, travel yeah. north, if you're in New Delhi, if you are in Shimla, you'd get more samosas. You'd get parantas, which is again potato right. stuffing when roti. Parantas, yep, 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 yeah. And you know, my nephew's married to a a, a woman from southern India, so. We have a connection and we don't even know it. <laughs> so yeah, again, coming to the production design now. Yeah. What are the key considerations when you're trying you're supposed to translate a writer's script and a director's imagination into visual design? How do you ensure that your design aligns with the overall vision of the film? Hmm. That's an interesting question. That's an open-ended question, too, because I think each script brings its own character to design. There's some scripts that you'll read that, I mean, every script involves design. Let me say that to begin with. But there's some that you read that <clears throat> are a little bit more obvious. And I think when you get into like fantastical scripts and things like that, you know, it's naturally more about sort of the imaginary world. The things I work on tend to be more realistic Real reality based, excuse me, reality based. Um, and I think, you know, for me, the types of projects that I sort of gravitate to are the ones where there's a sense of design and the design can be special. And at the same time, it doesn't want to overplay and become the element that people walk away from and say, this film was about design. I, I just, I feel like it should be supportive and it should be something that, um, that you employ, you know, when to use restraint and you know, when to indulge um, as you read the script and as you design the film, because there are moments where, you know, for instance, in Mank, when we did San Simeon Hall, which was elaborate um, structure for the film, you know, it had ornate detail to it. And it was very inviting from the design sense. And yet at the same time, there were some bedrooms that were very important and some offices that were very important. And at first glance, they feel mundane, but even the mundane has a quality and a, and a importance to it in supporting the storyline. So I think design needs to sort of fold into the story, not override the story, but be a part of it and sort of work as a companion with it to help tell what that story is. Because ultimately for me, when I read a script, I need to have something that tugs at my emotions, tugs at my heart, tugs at my being. And that ultimately is the goal, is to have people walk away and say, be pensive about the film, you know, think about it, um, have something about it that they question something in life, something about themselves, something about others, something about a situation. Um, and to me, that's what's important. So I, you know, as I said, I'm sort of, I'm quiet, I'm reserved. I shy away from the, from the limelight a little bit. And I think my design for the most part is strong. And I think one of its strengths is that it knows when to exhibit restraint. Since you if brought uh, Mank into the conversation, I'd like to point mm -hmm. out that Mank was a black and Mank was shot in black and white, which presents yes. unique challenges for production design. Can you talk mm -hmm. about how you adapted your design approach to suit the monochromatic theme of the film? Oh, right. Yeah. I mean, it was interesting because, you know, we did testing. Of course, I read sort of what they did in the past when they shot black and white all the time and the kind of colors they used and uh, the way they got depth out of black and white, you know, um, instead of just painting things gray and black and white, they would paint things colors because certain colors lend themselves to black and white better. And we did testing with different palette colors and I remember testing oranges and reds reds were especially uh good at, at being you know sort of an equivalent to a black almost um we had scenes where 
Um, we had red, white, and supposed to be red, white, and blue balloons representing the American flag. And we did tests and we found out that, you know, I think it was pink, blue, and green worked better. And, you know, it was kind of jolting, you know, and at the same time, we wanted the sets to feel real. So we were trying to find a balance between, you know, not painting a room pink and orange and having an actor walk into it and have to do a serious scene and yet giving it some painting it a, a tone that gave it some depth and felt real at the same time so as we experimented um and it was actually david he said let's just try shooting things on the noir filter on our iphone or on our samsung phone whatever you have and so we started doing that. And so everything that we we put into a set, whether it be a piece of furniture, whether it be wallpaper, whether it be a painted wall, we would do a test just with the Noir filter on our phones. And that's how we sort of, we use that as our standard. And that's how we kind of came to the colors that we ended up using to get to black and white. So um, it was an interesting exercise. You know, it was it was more complicated than one would think. Were there any particular sets or scenes in this film that were pretty hard to design? We've heard Finch, Fincher talk about uh, not getting access or permission to shoot inside the Hearst Castle and you had to recreate the replica of it during the shooting of Mank. What's the story behind it? Oh, right. Well, you know, the thing was that with the Hearst Castle, we didn't want to replicate it. We just wanted to emulate it. And... I think to try to replicate something like that would just be <clears throat> impossible because it's so ornate and it's so detailed and it's so lush. I didn't even go to it. I didn't even want to go look at it. I just referenced some photographs and then we took it and we took some key elements of the design of the Hearst Castle and we used those as a launching point. And from there, we just sort of embellished it and tried to make sets that felt like they could be that. And, you know, there was enough, I think, resemblance to it to sort of draw people in and make them feel like, oh, yes, I'm there without having to go into all the lush detail and expensive detail that we couldn't afford to make it exactly like Hearst Castle. So, you know, part of the the challenge on things like that is when you're you're dealing with a historic location there are restrictions and you know we ran into it with Hearst Castle when we shot Social Network we would tried to shoot at Harvard and they wouldn't allow us to do it because of um because Harvard's Harvard <laughs> and so we had to find ways to you know tell the story of Harvard using other locations and so forth and you know we actually replicated the the john harvard statue and we placed it in front of another school in massachusetts that felt like it had the same architecture as harvard had so you know you run into that in terms of these um these locations another major highlight of your career is the curious case of benjamin button now this mm -hmm. film spans multiple decades and locations. Can you describe the challenges you faced in creating the evolving setting for this film? Yeah. Um, boy, you're taking me back a few years. You know, <clears throat> that film was originally written for the state of Maryland. And then they rewrote it for New Orleans because we found that in scouting that New Orleans afforded us more in terms of texture and look. Um, and a second unit shot some of the, uh, there was footage shot in India, I believe. There was footage shot, you know, in several areas of Eastern Asia that um, a second unit did that Tarsem, Indian director, um, directed it. We filmed in the Caribbean, we filmed in Los Angeles, we filmed in New Orleans and the whereabouts of New Orleans. Um, so most of the stage work was done in Los Angeles and there was stage and location work done in New Orleans. Um, I think the challenge on that was just, you know, spinning, spinning multiple plates in different locations at the same time and, you know, trying to meet the schedule of production in terms of 
in two weeks, we're going to be back to Los Angeles. We want to shoot stage first. We want to shoot location second. Blah, blah, blah. You know, the usual rigors of filmmaking aside from the creative. Um, so it was kind of a logistical challenge in that sense, you know, just having several different art departments and several different locales. And I just went through that again on The Killer with David, which is coming out, which we shot two years ago now. And, you know, we filmed in, again, we based out of New Orleans. We filmed in the Dominican Republic. We filmed in Paris. We filmed in Chicago. We filmed outside Chicago. So it was the same sort of logistical challenge on that. Don, technology has had a significant impact on film industry. How has it influenced your role as a production designer? What tools and softwares do you find most valuable? I mean, right from your first film, The Joy Luck Club, to films like The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, Social Networking, to Mank, what changes mm. have you observed over the years? Well, I mean, I think the obvious is that, <clears throat> you know, there's so much more reliance on the computer and the programs that it offers in terms of design. And I think these are all very, very good programs. And, you know, it's sort of a double-edged sword. In one sense, they provide um, good information. You can draw a set on the computer, you can model it 3D, you can put it into an environment to see how it looks. Um, you can integrate forms and shapes into locations to see how they look. And you can do it three-dimensionally and you can lens it and you can, it's almost as if you're there. And it's, you know, it's very helpful in that sense because you get a sense of scale and knowing what you're getting. Um, but I still go back to the, the, the set designers that draw with pencil, you know, the, the, the old analog traditional way of doing it, because I feel like there's something that they bring to it with detail and with interpretation. And there's something about a pencil line that when it becomes, when it, becomes thin and then they put pressure on it, it becomes thick it tells a story there with what that set is and so what i usually do is i i begin working with people on computer and then i get it to a certain point and then i hand it off to pencil designers and say let's take this into the 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 stage where we add some character to this because some of the computer sets can be a little bit cold. And I realize they're very efficient and they're very good. I'm not demeaning either one, to be honest with you. And I'm not saying one is better than the other. I'm just, I just find that there's, there's a combination of things that, that works well. Um, in terms of, you know, set extensions and so forth, you know, on most of my work, we, we've really, we've done matte paintings on locations where we'll shoot a certain side of the street. We certainly did it on Mank, you know, and we'll just look at one side of a street and then the other side we'll strip out and we'll put a matte painting into, or we put green screen out of window and we do sort of the basic matte painting outside of windows. Um, and I think, you know, just in terms of CG there, they've gotten so good at doing things like water on Benjamin Buttons, the whole tugboat was built on stage. You know, all that work of it out at sea was done on stage without any water, and the water was put in CG. Um, you know, little detail things that I think it's more of an advantage for a director where there's reset times on, you know, things like blood splatters or gunshots or bullet hits and things like that. You know, it's just so much easier to do those CG now and so much better and more efficient and I think it allows a director to keep a rhythm on a shooting day you know um instead of having to do the old traditional way of okay clean it up let's reset let's reset um so in terms of design I don't I think for me it's knowing that those elements and those tools are there to use I don't think there's a reliance though on them um I mean I think there are obvious scripts and obvious situations where you, you say, okay, this was all going to be CG right here. There's just no way around it. And, you know, you, it's the way to execute it. And so you're wisely using the technology that is out there. But I think there are other situations where I personally 
prefer to try to do it live and real and the people I work with do. And there's just something about that where you try to do it live and real. And then if you need the help of the, the computer and the CG, you bring that in to, you know, amend what you've done. So Don, uh, just a couple of weeks back, I was having a conversation with Paul D. Osterberry, the guy who won the Oscar mm -hmm. for production designer of Sh uh, The Shape of Water. And mm -hmm. he didn't shy from calling himself unemployed because there are protests going in film industry at the moment. I assume they are writers protest. What's your take on that? I mean, there are always budget constraints that are common in film industry. I mean, there are writers protesting that they're not paid equally. What's your whole take on that? Yeah, now he he didn't shy from calling himself he a what unemployed, unemployed because there's no work. Oh going yeah, on. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm unemployed as well, and you know, my take on it is that there are two sides to everything, and I think all things in life, you know, if it's sort of a, it's like the politics in the United States. There are two sides to everything. And if you don't meet in the middle somewhere, then it won't get resolved, you know? And the way of the world is that those, those who hurt and suffer are the ones that uh, probably garner the less from it. So, you know, I, I think they should just, personally, I think they should just get in a room, sit down, figure it out. That's my take. Speaking on budget constraints, how do you manage to find a balance between creative vision and financial limitations when designing a project? Do you get mm. the amount what you have told to the producers or is there a rebuttal going between? Oh, there's a back and forth always, you know? And I think, it even, I mean, you know, this even sort of harkens to what I just said about you have to meet in the middle. And I think you always do on every project and anytime that, you can't just operate as if you have all the money in the world. You know, when I was in college, again, one of the professors in sculpture was telling me, and, and when I say sculpture, I mean, it was, it was not casting and things like that. This was kind of inventive sculpture, shall we say. Um, he was telling me that, he said, you know, with my first year students, I used to say, okay, you can do whatever you want. I just want to see a project twice, halfway through the semester and at the end of the semester. And he said, I gave him no restrictions. And he said, it just wasn't working. I wasn't getting good projects from the students. So I ch kind of changed course. He said, I told them, okay, for your first project, you get, you know, six feet of wood, half a quart of white paint, a pint of blue paint, 12 nails, you know, a bag of plaster, whatever. He gave them a list of materials and that would be their limit. And he said, the best things came out of that. And he said, I realized that being creative doesn't mean just absolutely being free from restrictions. And I think sometimes, I often think of that because I think sometimes in film, you know, it's, it's they're necessary times when it's you need the open creativity on certain types of projects certain types of sets but i think within every project there are also moments where you need restraints and you it will help you actually it'll help you think through what the story really is what this element needs to be what the set needs to be what the location needs to be and i, I think there's a balance to it all so you know, in terms of budget, there's always a back and forth. They always start off thinking sort of like, well, this feels like a, a $5 million set construction budget on this project, you know. And then as you get into it, oh, some locations fall through and all of a sudden it's turning into 6 or $7 million. But then there's some other things that, you know, go away and it comes back down to five and a half or five. And so th there's always a give and take to it all, you know, and I th very few times have I been in a situation where I've been on a project where it's just, you know what, you're asking for the impossible. There's no way I can do this. And I think it it's very apparent when you're on those projects that when they're asking for so much um, that you can't provide because of the cost, 
I think that's when you turn and you say, you know, I wish you luck. There's another way to do this. Good luck with it. Somebody else is better. Step away. Is is there any dream director that you would love to work with, with the likes of Tarantino mm. and others? Oh, gosh. Wow, I've never thought about that. That's an interesting question. There's you know? always Martin Skosky on the table. And there are many, yeah, people, many people. Mark, I'd like to see many. you collaborate with them. Yeah, no, no. I, I you know, I'm... I can't think of anybody specifically, but I mean, I certainly respect all of them. And, you know, there's so many directors I do respect. Um, and I sort of just enjoy looking at their films, to be honest with you, you know? So yeah. what does Donald Graham Bird do when not on the sets? Do you like traveling, camping, cooking, or playing any oh. specific sports? <laughs> um, I, I live a simple life at home. You know, I have a wife and... Um, we um, we hang out with our neighbors, as I said, and I just lead a simple life at home. I don't I don't travel because when I work, it seems like I travel so much when I work, and I try to bring my wife along. We kind of use that as our work slash vacation, so to speak, or when it's really just work. But um, so we like to just be at our home because it seems like over the years we have so little time to just be here and enjoy it. And what's the day at home like? Do you like reading, watching television? Yeah, a little bit of everything, you know, everything from actually, you know, sweeping the front steps <laughs> to doing some yard work, to taking a walk, to, you know, reading, to watching some show or something, you know? It's now, a bit are you of into a sports? Are you, are you into athletic sports? I mean, not cricket a, is pretty lot. new to America now. Cricket has entered America. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. Cricket's cricket. big. Yeah. Yeah. My in-laws um, are all big cricket fans. And, of course, my neighbor, you know, always lets me know when India is uh, is playing in cricket. Fact, in fact, I'm not sure if you're aware with that. Uh, U.S. and the Caribbean island are slated to host the T20 World Cup next year. Really? It, would this be like the West Indies? Yes, the, uh, I, I guess I, I'm not sure about the location. Have they been finalized or not? But yes, West Indies and USA are the two hosts of the T20 World Cup next year. Right. Was, wasn't there just a big match between... Yeah, it's it's actually... Pakistan. It's, yeah, yes, India Pakistan. and Pakistan. We just had an India and Pakistan match. India went on to win that match. That was a 50-over World Cup. So it right. is comparatively a bigger version. It's, it's like a 300-minute football game. If, right, right, yeah, yeah, but exactly. T twenty is short. T twenty is like twenty over game each side. Right, right. No, it finishes it's this quick. It finishes in three hours. Uh, the ODI cricket it takes a day, and then there's test match which uh, goes for like four or five days. Wow, yeah, yeah. And there's some big cricket um, in England. Cricket's pretty big too, isn't it? It it is pretty big in England in the uh, Indian subcontinent. It is pretty big in Australia. Australia is pretty good in cricket. Mm. They have mm. won like five World Cups. Yeah. And it's behind funny Australia sports. is India who have won two. Yeah. There, there are any international sports that the United States just doesn't, you know, we're so set on like our baseball and football and all that. And you go international and people talk about cricket and soccer and other things. And, you know, it's kind of nice because... It's more of an international thing. You know? And I assume that it, it could be the next big thing in the U.S. sports. Who knows? Yeah, who knows is right. Yeah. yeah. So, Donald, uh, can you discuss any of your upcoming projects you're excited about? Uh, you're also working on this blank uh, comedy television series called Sympathizers, I assume? Yeah, Sympathizer. I worked on that last year. And um, so what I can don't you expect from the project? Oh, it's a period, um, Robert Downey Jr. Um, it's based on the book, the award-winning book. And um, it takes place in the 70s. It's um, the it's about Vietnam, <clears throat> the Vietnam War. It's, uh, without saying too much, it's an interesting project, I think. It, it's, a, it's a good one. Robert Downey Jr. plays several characters in it, and... It's directed by Park Chung Wook, the Korean director, who's very interesting, um, has an interesting aesthetic and very nice to work with. Um, learned a lot from him. Um, 
so that's I don't know when that's coming out. And other than that, I'm just with the strike and all, everything sort of froze. So projects kind of been put on ice a little bit, to be honest with you. So um, I'm kind of just doing a few commercials right now. So what advice would you give to a person who's new to production designer, production design industry and looking for a break? Looking for a break. Um, take any job that is offered to you at any level. Um, be willing to work as the person in the office or on the set that sweeps the floor, does anything. And while you're doing it, pay attention. Just pay attention and be aware and find an opportunity to ask questions. And I think that's the best thing because I find the people that that knock on my, that work for me that are PAs, uh, production assistants or what have you, um, that come in, they work hard and they come one day and they knock on my door and they just say, you know, is there some time I can sit and talk with you and just ask you some questions and you know, I invite that because that means to me they've been thinking about it seriously. And, you know, their questions, it's interesting. The questions from these people are actually quite good. Um, they're not as childish as you might think or naive as you might think. Yeah, they're actually not, very, not as naive as my questions were in this interview. No, 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 no. No, but I mean, you know, you would think they'd say, you know, the questions are actually questions that make me think and make me ponder about what I'm doing and why I'm doing it, you know. And I have a I have a philosophy with my my whole team and that is that um and I tell I say this to everybody I hire, if you ever see me doing something that you feel is aesthetically wrong speak up and i say that to the to the pa as well you know if you walk on a stage and you see something on a set that you feel is just out of line pull me aside and just ask me or something and i may say no that's the way i want it or it may catch me and i go yeah because i think what's important as any kind of artist is to have that person who's not been six inches from the painting the whole time walk in and take a look at it and say oh did you realize that you know that shape isn't really round it's square and you kind of step back and you go oh wow you're right you know it's it's that revelation of a new eye on something that's important i think sometimes i think one question that i have missed is that uh did your parents have the pleasure to see you lift those oscars my mother you? did. My father passed away years ago, um, but, but my mother did, and she's still alive. She's 98, and she lives in, she still lives in Kansas in the Midwest. My father passed away um, in the late, in the late 90s. And what was your mom's reaction when you won the Oscar? Oh, you? she was, oh, she was elated, of course. She was completely elated, you know, she was, you know, it's small town. The, the whole town was elated and you know that was nice you know my father my father was a pastor a very simple man a kind man my mother is a very kind and generous simple simple woman so you know it was nice all right john uh it has been it has really been a pleasure having this conversation with you and going into the crevices of uh, production design uh i oh, hope you're coming i hope I hope you're coming to India someday soon. You how many times? Oh, I hope so too. You know, we've talked about it several times, as I said, with our neighbors, and you know, the opportunity over the years. I've been traveling so much on work, and it just hasn't. You know, then COVID hit, and everything got kind of messed up. You know, and so it just hasn't come about. But I hope so. You know, so and do you time, ever come? Next time you're you in come India, to LA? Please. Please you give us the pleasure to, to ha host you and we can probably oh. have the second interview with you in our studios. Oh, that'd be wonderful. Do you ever come to LA? Uh, we'll try. We'll try. Actually, uh, uh, our LA trip seems like, uh, I'm not sure at the moment, but LA, I guess, hosts the Consumer Electronics Show every year. Oh, right. Yeah. If yeah, possible, yeah. if possible, we'll try. If we can come to LA, if we can make it to LA. Otherwise, you come to India, we'd be gracious enough to host you. <laughs> You know, you've been so kind and so understanding. I really appreciate your interest. That's how every Indian is. So yeah, it's been so nice. 
Thank All you, right, so. John. It was really a pleasure having a conversation with you. And I hope to have more such conversations in the future as well. Absolutely. You take care. Thank you, dear. Okay. Thank have you. a nice day. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye.